There are the haves and the have-nots, and right now that is more pronounced than ever before. Today's video is going to break down how there are 100 million people right now not working. And there's more to that. The second thing is that there are banks right now today that are failing. And I'm going to show you the one example of Credit Suisse, but understand that this is already happening elsewhere. The third thing is that there is demand destruction going on right before our very eyes. And regardless of what they're willing to admit, I'm going to show you the truth. Does that sound good? Let's go. Living paycheck to paycheck has become the norm. Inflation takes its toll on American finances as emergency funds run dry. I have shown you this so many times before, no matter what survey, no matter what area, it all depends on the individual and what they are making. If they are making anywhere less than $250,000, there's a very good chance that they're living paycheck to paycheck. That's how extreme the circumstances have been today. But how could that be possible? You got a household making $250,000 in a year, minus taxes, and then all of their extra expenditures. Well, the way it works is that somebody's making $100,000, they're doing fine, they've got their apartment, they've got their house, they've got their car, they've got everything that they need, and then what happens? Well, they start making $150,000. So, do they bank an extra 50? No, they spend an extra 50, and that's the way it goes, all the way up the ladder. And you know people, I'm sure your co-workers, your friends, your family, your acquaintances, that no matter what, they're always paycheck to paycheck. Now, maybe they don't want to admit it, but you can kind of qualify that. If you know people and what their habits are, let's post that in the comments below. Let's start having this conversation, at least between us, because then we can go out there and perhaps, just perhaps, kind of plant a little seed as to what these people really should be doing because you need to set aside some level of this income or else you're going to be in big trouble if their job doesn't come in, if their health starts to take an impact in some way, or if conditions arise in which they cannot afford what they did before, they're going to be coming to you maybe angry, okay, because you got things sorted out. So let's have that conversation right here, right now. Let's talk about it, okay? U.S. GDP rebounds in the third quarter. Ah, yes, you remember that whole, hey, we're in a recession thing. No, 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 don't worry, because now it showed that there's some growth. Okay, GDP increased 2.6%. And at the bottom, it's basically saying, look, the data came out and effectively ends the debate that raged over the summer as to whether the U.S. economy was already in a recession. Ah, that's right. Well, what is the central bank doing? If you have the growth here, no recession fears. You look at the jobs numbers. Hey, they're all fantastic. What's the problem? I don't see why they're going through all of this when, you know, you and I know what's actually happening. Because in this GDP data, it showed that exports were the reason why it ended up in positive territory. The other data was actually not good, but because of exports, it kind of looks good because you look at the one number of GDP. You know, this is just incredible the way they do this. The labor market has remained tight this year, even as inflation hit a four decade high and parts of the economy cooled. Job openings, while off their peaks, are still historically high. This is important, okay? Because you look at the job situation, and this is what the Fed has introduced many times in their statements, as well as, you know, the, the question and answers and so on that they do. So you know that they're looking at the jobs numbers, unemployment, according to the U3 unemployment rate, very low. Do you see the job openings? That's another factor there. Then you look here, more than 6 million people didn't have a job because they were caring for a child or elderly person. 6.8 million people didn't want to be employed. You go down further, and it's, it's incredible here. The equivalent of 32 million people who aren't working are relying on savings to cover their needs. Another 26 million are using credit cards or loans, and 12 million have been borrowing from family or friends to help meet their expenses. This is shocking, okay? One more, okay? More than 20 million people are relying on government transfers or some type of unemployment insurance payments, food stamps, or government rental assistance. If that isn't shocking, I really don't know what is. I mean, I know we're getting desensitized to all this, 20 million people, 40 million people, food stamps, all these things, but it's important 
because the person that you encounter on a daily basis, maybe it's the cashier at the store, maybe it's the person that you walk beside or driving down the street with, these people are in this situation. Now, I'm going to talk about what can what we can do. I've got my two books as well. I've got the how to and solutions playlist. I've got a lot of uh, free information that people can look at, but it starts at home. Okay. We need to be looking at our finances, even if they're not very good. And we need to look at where the income is coming from. What can we do? We'll talk more about that at the end. So you stick to the end, you're going to get that information. Okay. Here we are. U.S. mortgage rates top 7% is the highest in more than 20 years. I've seen numbers uh, going a little bit higher than that. Depends who you're getting mortgage from. It depends on your credit. All these different things are going to affect that. But you look at this and understand the, um, the payment that people are paying today at 7% is going to be double what they were paying when it was at the bottom. A year later and everything suddenly changes. Okay, Very extreme to say the least. And so what are really the central banks doing? Well, if you look at the ECB, they had their decision, it came out, they're increasing yet again by 75 basis points. They've done this at a time in which it had been understood that no way the ECB is going to ever be able to increase interest rates, but they increased twice in a row. So they're trying to get inflation down to the 2% target. In here, it just mentions that for the euro area, 9.9% for inflation. So that is quite extreme for a place that they couldn't get inflation. I mean, they're, they were trying to stoke inflation for the longest period, couldn't make it happen, but they're still doing all kinds of different policies. It's just a strange uh, time that we're living in. Uh, we're going to print a whole bunch of money. We're going to you know, do all these things to throw cash left, right, and center. But at the same time, we're going to increase interest rates and mess things up. I, mean, I, I don't know what's going on. Look, there, there are banks today that are starting to fail. And we've been seeing this for a little while. Like if you look in China, what happened? But here we have it. Credit Suisse cuts 9,000 jobs to stem losses. Credit Suisse was involved in a lot. In fact, I have some examples here. I'll show you in just a second. But they're trying to split off their bank. You know what you do when you have uh, you know, a problem with one part or you lop it off and you kind of sell it somewhere else. Just like what we saw with the ESM, the EFSF, all these different alphabet things that were being created around 2011 to 2012, 2013 in the Euro area. In my book, I wrote about the Euro viral contagion, which is basically the chaos in the financial system. It could not be sustained. And then you started to have one bank and another, and then the sovereign debt became a huge problem as well. Countries debt became an issue because you go over 100% mathematically never going to be paid back. And now today we're dealing with the ramifications of this. And you look at these banks that are absolutely rotten to the core. Look here. You could see this. This is Credit Suisse. Okay. So remember Green Cell? I covered that a little while. That one went uh, insolvent. And then what happens? Well, Credit Suisse, they're involved. What about Archegos? I covered this over and over again. And I had all these people were telling me, oh, you said Archegos was going to fail and it was going to create the, the global collapse. And I didn't say that. Look very carefully. It's having a direct impact on this major financial institution that is Credit Suisse. And I talked about that initially. Who are the most exposed banks? Credit Suisse was the one that I talked about. And now you could see material impact. Okay, so that's Archegos. Then the chairman resigns Then the profit problem. New CEO comes in, has no impact whatsoever on positivity. And then it hits a record low just after. Now they're trying to do this whole merger and lop off this and sell it to that. And oh my goodness. Uh, nothing's going to be resolved, of course. I wanted to show you what's happening here with individuals and their own personal circumstances with inflation and so on. U.S. energy executives have said that shuttered crude oil refineries will not be restarting. Now, what's happening here? The one interesting thing that came out of it, too, was that there was consideration for the ability to restart refining capacity that had been shut down. And I think the general sentiment was that wasn't going to to happen. At the bottom, it's so important. You need to understand this. Building a refinery is a multi-billion dollar investment. It may take a decade. We haven't had a refinery built in the United States since the 1970s. My personal view is that there will never be another refinery built in the US. 
This is, I mean, oh my goodness, what do you think will happen to prices long term? And they're basically saying, why would I invest in this? Why would I put money into this, build something that's going to take 10 years when they're telling us that we're not going to be in this business in 10 years? They're pushing for that. The government regulations are being put in. So obviously, there's no business incentive to do that. And that means until you know, there's a time in the future, you're going to be paying higher and higher and higher and higher prices. Because even if the raw material is relatively expensive, the refining process isn't going to be, it's just going to continue to go up. Look, is this information good? Is this informative for you? You got to hit that subscribe button. Do so. And I'm going to bring you a video each and every day. Tomorrow's video, you're really going to want to see. Okay. So make sure you hit that subscribe. Take a look here. For freight companies, this year's peak will be weak. The freight industry is looking at a very, very ugly end of 2022. This is Q4, as I've said many times before. When you look at Q4, it has been shown that there's constantly issues in Q4. You're going to pay a higher price. You're not going to be able to get what you want. You're going to be dealing with all kinds of delays and shipment problems and everything, but not this year. It's very odd. And just my personal circumstances, um, actually, it was unusual that Amazon restricted the number of units you're able to ship in as if they're preparing for higher volumes. So I'll be bring you an update on that as I see and that's actually a, something that upset me today. I just got notified about that. Heineken warns of soft and by the way, uh, I'm only allowed right now at this time 4000 units, which is ridiculous. 4000 units at a time is not enough to be selling consistently. Uh, but anyway, that's that's my little rant. Heineken warns of softer demand as inflation hits drinkers. Now this one surprised me because usually people give up the drink and last before all the other things, but that's Heineken for you. And you look at what's been going on over the last little while, and you got to understand that time and time again, individuals will push themselves to the edge, whether they have to, or this is just the nature of things, look carefully at the consumer. The consumer is the key. And so how well is the consumer behaving today? I mean, we have to look at this information because that's going to tell a real story. Statistically, the US is growing. You look at their, their data, hey, GDP is up. But in reality, this is not an accurate depiction of what's happening. And you can look at the other data to tell the truth. Demand is softening in many areas, clearly impacted by rising rates. Lower rates would have the opposite effect. So when we see the pivot that everybody's waiting for, that's going to be something that I believe people should be watching because they're going to want to put money in. They're going to want to expand their business. They're going to be wanting to do things. But until that time comes, the risk is too high. Try to eliminate your exposure to high or variable interest rates. This is so key, so important. A lot of people are heavily reliant on credit card debt and other time, maybe even their mortgage, which is on variable, depending on where you live. Some places, uh, Canada, 26% variable mortgage rates. Australia, I think it was, that was something like 80%. Um, but anyway, the point is you want to get off of that because rates are going up. So if you can get into a fixed rate, at least you could sleep well at night. That's the way I look at it. Learn a new skill, update existing skills, partner with somebody that has the skills that will bring you additional income as work environment is changing. It was, it's not what it was before. Okay. The world is changing very rapidly and we need to stay on top of this. If you have the friends and connections, you can't be everything. Okay. You can't be an electrician, a construction worker. You could fix computers. You know how to you know, sing, you know how to play guitar, you know how to how to you know do flooring, you know how to build a, a house, whatever. You can't do everything, but you need to partner with the right people. You have those friends and connections because each person is going to be able to benefit each other. And that mutual benefit is more important now than we've had in literally decades. Okay. Nobody's growing their own food. Nobody's taking care of themselves, but we need to have at least a connection with somebody that has that thing that we desire and we could both bring uh, what we have to the table. Okay. So these are the things I talked about today. If you have any other suggestions or anything, you want to let me know in the comments below. I look at all of the comments, try to reply to as many people as I possibly can. You got to subscribe because tomorrow's video is going to be real key. You're going to want to check that out. Hit that subscribe. See you tomorrow.